Hey everybody, this is Ben Atkinson and this is our interview series about inspiring leadership. I am super excited for our next guest. Um, he's an astronaut, explorer, physician, entrepreneur, um, and we've got so much to talk about. Um, Jonathan, could you please introduce our guest? Yeah, thanks, Ben, and uh, welcome everybody to our favorite time of the week. And as part of the Inspiring Leadership series, we have Scott Parazinski, MD. Scott is the CEO of Fluidity Technologies. He's also a NASA astronaut. Uh, he's a very much motivational speaker. He has the usual style that we have with our speakers who are humility, humanity, and humor. Um, he's also the author of The Sky Below. Uh, he summited Mount Everest. He's rappelled into a very dangerous volcano. He's free dived into the world's, one of the world's highest lakes. And he's an all around good guy. Scott, welcome. Lovely to have you on the series. I'm thrilled to be with you, gentlemen. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's lovely. So, Scott, let's um, talk a bit about the current work that you're doing. There's a number of different things you're involved in, some amazing technologies. Um, and, of course, we'd love to hear about sort of SpaceX and things like that and brands and various things. But tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now. And then we'll go to your life. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, well, first off, I have to say, that despite uh, the, the challenges under which we currently live, the, the pandemic, the economic challenges, the, the social uh, issues that we collectively are facing, not just in, in my country, the United States, but of course in, uh, there in, in Europe as well and are probably around the globe, um, it's also a very exciting time to be alive. And, and so I'm a glasses half to three quarters full kind of person. I'm an optimist, uh, try and find the, the positive, um, and try to uh, you know, help find uh, solutions. Try, I try to become part of the solution rather than contributing to the problem. So uh, um, as a technology innovator, I see so many different opportunities to, uh, to ultimately make the world a better place. And so uh, as uh, uh, an inventor and an entrepreneur, my, my day job is as CEO and founder of Fluidity Technologies, which is based on converting human intent into motion. And, uh, and what that means in the nuts and bolts of it is, how can we more intuitively move something like a drone or a virtual reality simulation or even a surgical robot inside the human body much more intuitively so that you know the operator, whether it's a pilot or a surgeon or a gamer, uh, can do so almost subconsciously and really focus on what they're doing as opposed to the challenge of how they're going to get there because we have these amazing capabilities to, uh, I think, uh, in the not too distant future, here in Houston or there in London, teleoperate a surgical robot in sub-Saharan Africa or remote Nepal and deliver the same quality of care as we have in our home cities uh, in, you know, in advanced uh, um, medical uh, facilities. So that's really my passion is uh, trying to you know, find ways to improve the quality of life through technology. And um, if we just kind of look broadly across uh, what's what's happening in the technology space, just a couple of days ago, we had uh, Elon Musk's company SpaceX launch a crew of four astronauts to the International Space Station, a flawless mission. Um, and this, of course, is a company that was, you know, founded and funded by a private citizen. And, uh, and now, you know, look at what they're able to do, you know, starting to think about going back to the moon and even on to Mars and colonizing uh, the red planet one day. Um, so I, you know, I think if we can come together uh, as innovators to, to challenge the, the world's most vexing problems, I think we have a lot to offer. Um, yeah. You know, and, and there's so many different questions I'd love to ask you. Let me perhaps begin with, you know, I have met many NASA astronauts. You know, how did how did you become a NASA astronaut, and what was the experience like? I know you write about it in your book. What was the experience like when you were up there in space and looking down on planet Earth? Well, as I as I describe it, it's the best job in the universe, and uh, you know, I have a, a pretty good perspective to, to be able to make that boast. But uh, not that I'm a, a boastful person, but it, it is just a wonderful perspective that uh, I hope many more people will get a chance to experience. You know, we. We are at the kind of barnstorming era of commercial human spaceflight with Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin soon to take uh, even 
paying uh, tourists to uh, suborbital space to, you know, have a, a life changing four or five minutes in weightlessness and to see their planet from that that God's eye perspective. So it, it's it's an amazing um, yeah, personal experience, uh, and I was very fortunate to have grown up during the. Uh, the beginning of the the space race, if you will, my father worked on the Apollo uh, Saturn V boosters that first took astronauts to the moon in the late '60s, early '70s. So I had a front row seat uh, to these um, amazing times. I I saw the launch of Apollo Nine from the beach there at Cocoa Beach, Florida, and uh, it was kind of a defining moment in my life. I, I want to ride one of those things. I, I want to be part of this program, um, and uh, I just never lost sight of of that ambition. I, I didn't always talk about it. I kind of kept it under wraps because I thought people would think I was nuts, but um, just kind of relentlessly pursued uh, where I wanted to be. And and then I was at, at the right place at the right time when NASA was looking for uh, physician astronauts to help prepare for and, and operate the International Space Station that was kind of on the drawing boards at that time. So, you know, a little luck doesn't hurt either, but uh, um, what's really exciting now is you know, in the near future, it's not just uh, you know, government astronauts who will be traveling into space. It'll be people who are going on vacation uh, to scientists and engineers using the laboratory of, of microgravity to study important problems uh, affecting us here on planet Earth. So um, we're kind of in, in these, uh, as I said, barnstorming days of, of space flight. Yeah. And and also, what, what was it about you, uh, Scott, that got you sort of going for Everest, uh, going into this volcano, doing free diving as well? I mean, you know, any one of those things is, is a life changing experience. But you decided to do like about four or five. And there's a whole list of other things you haven't even mentioned yet that you do. Where did this all come from? Uh, well, uh, some people might say that I'm not very bright, uh, that, you know, I, I've uh, that I'm a, a daredevil or something of, of that nature. But actually, um, uh, I, I'm not uh, an outright risk taker. In fact, uh, I would describe myself as a risk manager. <clears throat> and, and the reason I'm drawn to to high lofty places and other challenging environments is because as an innovator, it it forces us to think in a different frame of reference. Um how can you go uh, rappel down adjacent Messiah Volcanoes lava lake and uh, and gather science and do so safely? What are the technologies that you need to to go there? Um, how can you uh, you know uh, free dive into La Concabur volcano in the in the summit called Caldera Lake there? Um, well, you need to be prepared. You need to be well trained. You need to have technology matching the the environment. Uh, you need to have a, a good uh, uh, camaraderie and, and, and team uh, work ethic. Um, all the things that go into a space flight go into these other you know, challenging environments. Um, the value there is, is extraordinary. You know, when we, we challenge ourselves as human beings to go into you know, these types of environments, this mindset, this inventiveness to, to do useful, meaningful, safe work there, allows us to invent technologies that we can bring back to our daily lives here, uh, you know, in our homes. And so the, the space program is a wonderful example. The, uh, the many technologies that are in our, our intensive care units, for example, the miniaturized sensors, the computing assets, uh, you know, some of the materials that were developed for the early space program, we now take for granted as part of everyday healthcare. And so that's why we make these investments and why we challenge ourselves. It's there, certainly there's an adventure there, there's an excitement, but the ultimate is to translate that innovation into our our daily lives. Yeah, and it's very interesting. It takes me back to my days as a military communicator. I was in electronic warfare, listening to mm -hmm. the Russians, the East Germans, and, and the technology that uh, the Americans ourselves and we worked with the Danish and the and the West Germans. Mm -hmm. uh, it was was you know big chunky bits of kit which now are handheld phones but right there was something pushing it like there was you know space exploration pushed a whole lot of things it's the same for us and thinking back to yourself as a young man um what bit of advice with all the wisdom you've now accumulated in your in all these battle scars and things you've done uh, badges you've got on your arm on your nasa um uh, spacesuit what um 
what bit of advice would you give to the 18 year old Scott Parzynski? Uh, it, it's uh, two things, uh, tenacity and then um, pre-visualization. So the, the things that are most valuable to us uh, later in life um, are things that we've had to work the hardest for. Um, if even if there's some accomplishment that uh, you know, might might be seen as uh, you know a, a great trophy, if if you haven't worked for it, if it if if it's not been a hard won uh, battle, it's it's probably not that significant to you. So, being prepared for uh, the challenge, being resilient. Um, another thing that I, I think I actually learned uh, as a Boy Scout. Uh, in the United States, uh, the highest rank is called Eagle Scout. I don't know. I think it yeah. may be called the King Scout or Queen Scout. Yeah. I, Eagle Scout. Yeah. 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 Um, and so as a young uh, young boy, basically deconstructing the pathway to getting the Eagle Award, uh, it can be very discouraging to a lot of kids. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a long uh, uh, progression, many merit badges and service projects and and so on and so forth. And and so what I taught myself to do, it, it, it came with some um, evolution, I suppose, but I just focused on the next merit badge and the next service project and the next rank, as opposed to just focusing on, well, I want to become an Eagle Scout. And that same sort of um, deconstruction of seeing where I want to go, but then finding achievable uh, steps along that pathway uh, that I could reward myself with to to feel like I was making progress. Um, that actually has been retread so many different times in my life. A, a great example is um, climbing Mount Everest. You know, it's the tallest mountain in the world. Um, and a, a similar story, I, I, I've had uh, the experience of being in base camp and and hiking in with people to uh, to base camp and seeing people actually turn around, realizing that there's no way that they can make that final two miles uh, to the summit, vertical miles to the summit. It's you know just beyond their comprehension. If, on the other hand, you're able to see it as one day at a time, one rope length at a time, and, and on summit day, even you know one footstep at a time, uh, you can make it. And so it's just you know having a, a framework that's uh, um, able to uh, to define success in different ways. Yeah, it is very interesting, and various friends I've had like. Uh, an English couple, a husband and wife team who went up there and did it. And friends in the SAS and things who, who some who got so close and then they had an ice fall. Mm -hmm. And then of course that very profound book into thin air yeah. uh, when so many died on the, on the summit. Was it a, a particularly treacherous time for you? Was some pretty close scrapes where you thought you could have died? Um, Cause there's lots of bodies still up there, aren't there? They just haven't been taken down. Sadly, there are too many uh, bodies still there, are probably 300 souls at this point uh, that made a one-way trip. And so for me, I took the same kind of mindset that I used training for my space missions to Everest. And, and so for me, it was all about making it a round trip. It's not successful until you've, you've set your boots back down at base camp. And, uh, and so I did have some really tough uh, experiences there. I had, uh, I had to treat some very serious illnesses uh, as a physician climber, uh, high altitude pulmonary edema, uh, potentially a heart attack uh, in another uh, climber. Um, yeah, it, you see very difficult things. I myself actually, uh, on my first attempt on Mount Everest in 2008, ended up rupturing a disc in my lumbar spine uh, at nearly uh, uh, 24,000 feet or 7,000 meters above sea level and having to hobble down and uh, you know, not knowing at all what was going on with me other than I was in the worst pain of my life. Uh, not a good spot to, to find yourself in trouble, by the way. Uh, no one's gonna be able to, to pull you down. It's, it's under your own power or you're, you're gonna be a, a permanent relic there. So I was very motivated to, yeah. uh, to descend. And, and that really leads me into my next question, which is the, um the proudest moments and the darkest moments of your life. I mean, when you're in such excruciating pain and, and each step is agony and you've just got to keep, you know, crawling your way down, that, that must have been one of them. But what, what others would you pick as proudest and darkest moments and what they taught you? 
the proudest moment of my life, uh, the best day on the job ever for me was on my last space mission. Uh, it was called STS-120. Uh, and uh, it was the fourth and final spacewalk of the, uh, the mission. Um, actually leading up to that, uh, um, on the third spacewalk of the mission, uh, we had installed a, a large solar array truss, a, a big solar wing that uh, for a reason that we didn't learn until later, uh, it, it had become snagged and it began to rip apart as the crew was commanding it to extend. So there's an enormous tear at the very tip of the space station uh, on the solar panel. And uh, it was sort of a limp noodle out there. And and uh, the concern was that if we were to undock the space shuttle, uh, we could either damage the space shuttle or the space station. Additionally, we needed the power from that solar panel to allow us to launch future Japanese and European modules to the ISS. So something had to be done. And uh, uh, NASA, in its finest form, spent the next 72 hours finding a way to get uh, a jury-rigged uh, robotic arm uh, cobbled together in a way that had never been conjured up before. They developed this incredible uh, robotic trajectory to get a spacewalker out to the very tip of the space station further than we'd ever gone before, using tools that had never been you know, developed before and procedures that had never been uh, imagined to stitch it back to, to good health and allow it to be deployed. And, uh, and so I was the, the lead spacewalker in the flight and ended up being at the end of this uh, ungainly robotic arm, I guess I was, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a sacrifice. You know, it's a, you know, they're willing to risk my uh, <laughs> uh, uh, me out there, but uh, um, it was really a, an amazing uh, team effort. Um, the the brilliant work that happened on the ground, the the coordination between mission control and and the crew inside the space shuttle space station, and then. Doug Wheelock and myself out at the tip of the space station doing this work and how it all came together. Uh, we were able to uh, cut out a piece of guide wire that had been hit by orbital debris, uh, space junk from an, a prior, who knows, a booster or something that had had uh, long since passed, but uh, uh, to then be able to repair it. And, and now uh, it's, it's up there aboard the International Space Station uh, for as long as that flies. And so the... Uh, I guess the lesson for me is just, uh, you know, the um, the power of, of teams, multidisciplinary thinking, uh, resilience, never giving up. NASA is, is famous and rightly so for having these, uh, you know, gargantuan challenges before them and uh, in finding solutions that they almost make look easy. Um, and uh, I, I can assure you that this wasn't an easy thing to go do, but, um, they were able to, to overcome it. And it, you know, it was my, my great honor to be a, a part of that. Um, the darkest uh, uh, times for me have to do with, you know, my family, uh, you know, and as a physician, um, perhaps I understand too much about, you know, what can possibly go wrong with the human body and, and, and projections of, of, uh, of things, outcomes and so on. But uh, to see your children, uh, you know, in harm's way or, you know, suffering is, is really the, the most awful time of my life. I, my son uh, was born with what's called Highland membrane, uh, which is basically premature lungs. And um, he was uh, you know, really struggling, huffing and puffing for the first hours of his life. And we transferred him to a pediatric hospital here in town, a wonderful place called Texas Children's Hospital where he received amazing care. He was intubated for about three days, received medication that uh, called surfactant that allowed his lungs to mature. And now he's a strapping, uh, you know, very successful 23 year old uh, young professional and, and doing great. But it was, uh, um, it, it's really, you know, devastating to not know that your, your kids are going to be okay. And, and then uh, you know, if that weren't enough, um, my, uh, beautiful, wonderful daughter Jenna is uh, 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 autistic, um, and she's a the greatest joy in our life. Just an exuberant personality, but uh, you know, coming to terms with that and, and helping her find her her uh, her pathway through life uh, uh, initially was very difficult. Um, we're really excited about you know the young woman that she's become, but uh, those are really challenging uh, um, experiences when you're. 
it hurts more, I think, when it's when it's your family than even yeah. if uh, that we're coming at yourself. Yeah, um, I, I relate to that. My brother's a surgeon, and uh, often his children didn't get as looked out after as well as they could. Oh, they're fine. You know, they'll be all right. But um, they had a few challenges. But it's interesting you mentioned about your daughter's autism. A couple of the uh, male and female leaders that we've had on the series, the Inspiring Leadership series, um, were good enough to talk about their own autism. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I find a number of the CEOs that I coach uh, are autistic and have sons who are autistic or daughters who are autistic. Um, and it's it's actually they they it's made them specialize in certain areas that they bring skills to. Absolutely. Um, the series and uh, one of the ladies is a chairman of a number of top organizations including the um she was chair of the institute of directors in the uk so you know she's a hugely successful person but mm -hmm. came out and talked about it and i think it's important people talk about being neurodiverse as it's called correct i'm, I'm neurodiverse mine is dyslexia uh mm -hmm. reading writing and maths which is a bit of a challenge um but uh, yeah interesting really interesting um I would normally talk about healthy, wealthy, wise. I want to just focus on the health bit because for you to become an astronaut, for you to uh, get to Mount Everest, uh, go into free diving and things like this, a number of these explorer uh, things that you've done, you've got to be very fit. How have you kept yourself fit and how are you keeping yourself fit at the moment, Scott? I, I think, uh, you know, Fitness is a, a role for all of us, you know, uh, throughout our, our lifespan. It's it's so important to, uh, you know, watch what you eat and and keep your your heart and, and body, uh, um, you know, uh, stressed in a healthy healthy manner. So, to uh, yeah, for for me, I I love the outdoors. I I love uh, as uh, alluded. Uh, I love challenging myself in in um, in the outdoors. So, you know. Getting outside and, and biking, um, hiking, um, stadium steps when I'm when I'm able. Uh, it's it's a little bit harder uh, when you're traveling all the time. Uh, of course, I haven't really traveled in, in about eight months, uh, like most of the planet. But uh, um, even when you're on travels, you know, to, to try and get outside, see the uh, the local environment, you know, go for walks uh, in the city of of your of your travels is something that I would try and do. But right now, uh, you know. Uh, what I have in the house is a, is a Peloton bike. In fact, uh, a week after the, uh, the pandemic was, was really declaring itself here in the United States and things were starting to close down, uh, my wife and I you know, bought a Peloton bike and we've really enjoyed doing that. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think it's important to keep uh, not only your mind active as, you, as we age, but also your, your body. And, uh, and obviously to, to try and watch uh, what you eat and drink um, you know, splurging every once in a while is okay, but, uh, you know, on balance, you know, try to keep it, keep it healthy. Brilliant. And, uh, I'm confessing here on air that I've gone, uh, three weeks now, uh, teetotal, uh, I'm oh. sober. Uh, not, I'm an alcoholic, but, um, I've just decided to do it for a year, see how right. I get, my, my, both my brothers have done it before me, the doctor and the, uh, the artist. Um, we've got Don, we've got Rob, and we've got Janine. We've all been asking some great questions. I think perhaps Janine's one, uh, Ben, if you could bring it in. Um, it's about, it, she's Janine uh, Korkilu. Uh, I can't even pronounce it. C-O-R-C-I-U-L-O, -O, Korkilu. Um, but anyway, Janine, forgive me for mispronouncing it. What do you practice, um, Scott, on a regular basis in order to keep you mentally healthy? That's a fascinating question, Janine. Um, you know, I do a, a couple of things that I think perhaps contribute um, to this. I, I enjoy reading. I, you know, I think uh, um, exposing myself to, to different mindsets, uh, uh, challenging thoughts, uh, you know, and philosophies. So um, I, I, I try to uh, keep a, a stack of books on my nightstand. I'm sometimes I get too busy with my day job um, and I carry that to, uh, to bed with me and I don't get a chance to, uh, to read as, as much as I would like. Um, but I, I think, you know, reading and also just kind of, uh, you know, discourse with, with others to, uh, uh, to keep, uh, my broader world worldview. And, uh, another thing that I do, and I'm not sure it, it contributes to my, uh, reaction times or, or mentally mental acuity, but I do enjoy, uh, puzzles. Um, and so, um, uh, that's sort of a diversion if, if I'm uh, on an Uber ride or uh, have a, um, 
you know, 10 minutes in between uh, sessions or something, uh, not enough time to, to uh, work through my email. I'll do a uh, you know, crossword puzzle or something along those lines uh, mm. uh, or other types of you know, mental puzzles to uh, um, just challenge myself. I don't know that it uh, it it, it uh, contributes positively or negatively, but uh, I hope it does. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's great. And then um, if we perhaps go for Don McIntyre next, and Don says, "Hi Scott, how do you set your goals? Do you focus medium to long term, or more short term ones that will add up to something bigger and longer term?" Ah, oh, great, John. Well, um, I, I do like to. Um, set, uh, you know, lofty long-term goals, but I, I realized that I would probably get discouraged if, if I, uh, you know, set out to, um, develop, uh, teleoperated surgery, uh, which is actually one of my, uh, long-term goals, um, that I'm, I'm working on step-by-step -step through my company fluidity technologies. But if, if I were to say, you know, from day one, that's what I want to do, Tell us more about that. That sounds very interesting, your technology that you're doing there. Right. So my, my company, Fluid, Fluidity Technologies, is about human-machine interfaces <clears throat> and making motion in three-dimensional space uh, very intuitive, very precise, uh, and reducing the, the training time to be able to master these types of activities. So um, not to get too much into the weeds, but Da Vinci Surgical Robotics is, is a a way in which a surgeon can work at a console and and with robotic arms uh, a few feet away do quite complex things inside the human body. I would like to create a system that is not so difficult to learn, that would be ultimately more precise, uh, and that would allow a surgeon there in London to uh, operate um, half a world away uh, by giving the surgeon tactile feedback and to and precise control of of the tip of the uh, the catheter or the, the suction device or the bovi catheter or what have you. But uh, if I were to uh, you know, state that as my uh, my goal from day one and kind of, you know, figure out all the myriad of steps to get to that, that summit, you know, I, I would get really discouraged very, very quickly. So instead I'm, I'm working at it in a manageable um, pace. Yeah. And so to do that, you know, I, I built a company around drone flight control. There, there are no significant regulatory hurdles for me to do that. We've, we've perfected a technique to fly drones with a single hand with much greater uh, intuitive ease. And uh, one day we'll be able to use that same sort of technology uh, for surgery. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I'm about to hand over to Ben. Um, my final question really is what makes a good, inspiring leader? And then maybe Ben can pick up Rob's question during his session. But what do you think makes a good, inspiring leader and a good team in your experience? I think empathy uh, and, and good listening skills. And, um, you know, the, one of the best leaders I've ever had the good fortune to work with, her name is Pam Melroy. She was my commander on my last shuttle flight and space shuttle mission. And uh, she had this way of, you know, drawing the best out of her entire crew. And I, I call it situationally appropriate leadership. She was the, the leader of the mission and had ultimate responsibility for the safety and success of our flight, uh, along with our lead flight director, Derek Hosman in Houston. But uh, there, there are times when the rookie astronaut on our crew might have the most insightful aha moment or the, you know, the, the direction in which we should go. Um, additionally, there's no way for any one person to know everything. So, uh, you know, I was the lead spacewalker. Stephanie Wilson was the lead robotics person. You know, Paolo was, uh, you know, had other, on our crew had other roles. So by uh, recognizing that uh, other individuals in a crew may have the most uh, relevant insight, we call this situationally appropriate leadership. Well, you know, Scott, you've got it, or you know, Paolo, you've got it, um, or let's talk about it. And so, uh, the the way that um, she was able to blend, uh, you know, a, a great warmth and empathy for people, but but also at times when you know things were getting serious, she could step in when a decision needed to be made. As the commander, she could do that as well. So, being able to uh, seamlessly uh, move through these different styles of leadership, 
but always uh, with a, uh, a knowledge by the crew that, you know, there was uh, an empathy and a concern there from her. Great. Well, I'll seamlessly hand over to Ben Atkinson. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. Um, and and uh, you're right. We've got a question from Rob um, uh, Thurl. Um, which I think uh, is is a is a good one to sort of start with. And if anybody else has got any questions, please do post them up. It'd be great great to hear some more. Um, so he's asking, do you find it difficult with friends and family to discuss day to day life when you have such an exciting and absorbing career? Well, well, thank you, Rob. And um, you know, I think um, my day to day life is every bit as exhilarating uh, as you know the, the uh, work that I've done in other. Uh, chapters of my life. So, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I've hung up my spacesuit, so to speak, and uh, I'm, I'm grounded, not, uh, not by uh, any uh, uh, decision by, by NASA or anything, but I decided that it was time for me to, uh, to make the move to uh, more terrestrial pursuits. But, you know, I, I think um, I, I talk about uh, the things that I'm involved with now, with uh, the same passion that I did when I was talking about about spaceflight, I think, you know, uh, it's it's very important to be excited about what you're doing, and uh, uh, so my my family shares uh, with me the, the excitement that they they have in their lives, and I share with them what I'm I'm doing in my life. Um, um, I'm not sure if I'm directly answering your question, but uh, um, I I think. Uh, um, one of the things that I always uh, uh, tried to do when I, I describe my work uh, in space, for example, uh, it, it's it's not about the uh, adventure all the time. It's about um, the, the the value that we can bring down here to Earth for all of us. And uh, mm. so I, I try to I try to ground it. The reason we go to space is is not to just have this you know grand adventure, but uh, to to create technologies, new jobs, and new activities for people here on earth. And uh, um, so that, that's how I guess I would frame that. Yeah. I should imagine that that, um, that, that those journeys that you had in, in, in space or the, from sitting in, <laughs> in the seat wait, waiting to be blasted off, um, from opening the hatch to, for the first sort of walk, there must have been loads of times where you didn't have, have time to really sort of take it in until you were we're back on the ground. <laughs> what were were there any moments where you did actually sort of have have um, had time to to really sort of take in the the enormity of, of of what you were doing? That's a great question, Ben. Yeah, I I did have several uh, wonderful you know uh, moments to just absorb the enormity of the universe and and mm. the this extraordinary life experience that I was gifted with. Uh, one time. Uh, it was on my my fourth flight into space. I was outside on a spacewalk with a, a Canadian astronaut, Chris Hadfield, and we were installing robotic arm uh, for Canada uh, to the ISS. And uh, um, I had about forty five minutes, uh, uh, essentially waiting for uh, Chris to finish up a task so that we could come back together and continue the the assembly. And so to have a half an orbit uh, of our planet just to take it all in to see um, the southern lights to fly through the, this uh, this curtain of very pale light that extends hundreds of miles up into the atmosphere and to just uh, you know eyes uh, you know wide open uh, you know almost viscerally feel that uh, um, wow. that experience was something that's etched in, into my mind uh, but uh, the other thing that I would try to do at the end of every day on orbit I spend about two months total over the, the span of my five space shuttle missions. At, at the end of every day, uh, before bedtime, I would uh, I would just put on some beautiful music, maybe some Mozart or some um, some blues or something like that, and just look out the window. And, uh, mm. you know, there are the Bahamas. There are the Himalayas, you know. Um, wow. You know, there's Dakar, Senegal, where I used to live, the westernmost point of Africa. So, you know, it, it, it was this, you know, God's eye perspective that uh, – I tried to absorb and and so when I when I do go out and talk to my family and friends, but also you know especially young people, I try to share the fact that you know, this is the future that you know you know could be yours as well. The the day where 
the space is only for government astronauts, that's over. You know, mm. in fact, uh, within a year, there's going to be the very first uh, crew flying aboard Axiom. It's uh, a crew that will fly aboard a, a SpaceX Dragon to a, a new module aboard the International Space Station. So there will be quite well healed uh, space tourists going up to the uh, International Space Station. But in the future, uh, there are going to be ways for people to afford and, and travel into space. And um, I'm, I'm so excited about that, that mm. time. That future, yeah. 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 And what, I mean, just sort of looking at that and how, how the sort of the, the, the space exploration has really sort of changed recently with the sort of partnerships between governments and, and um, corporations. What do you sort of see the the, the future of space exploration looking like? Because there's so much, um, uh, there's so many sort of things about uh, we'll colonate Mars, we'll do this, we'll do that. Um, what what's your sort of vision for for, for the future there? Yeah, well, I, I I think we're we're going to transition from this barnstorming era of spaceflight that I described into actual you know commerce. If we think back to the beginning of the last century, we had the Wright brothers and the the pioneering days of aviation to then, uh, you know, the military and, and postal applications of it to now, you know, with a few clicks of a mouse, we can buy a ticket on an airplane and be almost anywhere on the planet. This coming jet, this coming century, I think is going to be the transformation into space. We'll be able to use space in, in ways that are almost unimaginable now to be able to um, use suborbital uh, kind of, trajectories to kind of skip along the top of the atmosphere and to fly from Heathrow uh, to Johannesburg or to New York City or, you know, half a world away and be there within 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, th those kinds of leaps are going to be there because, you know, the, uh, you know, because commercial drivers are there, the economies of scale will make it possible. And so there's an incredible surge of investment into this sector that I think is going to make those uh, those quantum leaps and capability happen. Mm. Yeah, it all sort of like starts to, and probably from your perspective, you you've you've already experienced this, make our world sort of seem a, a lot smaller <laughs> over time. And uh, yeah. yeah, I think Absolutely. something something that really has done that this year is is the whole COVID crisis. And mm -hmm. um, how's how's that sort of affected affected you personally? And 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 your sort of vision for your, your, your business in the future. Yeah, th this has just been uh, 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 an abysmal year, um, but there are some silver linings to it as well. And again, I, I mentioned you being a half to three quarters full uh, glass kind of person, but uh, COVID has directed uh, me and my family directly. Uh, both of my parents were hospitalized uh, with the disease and my mother for nearly three weeks. Oh, wow. She survived. Both both of my parents survived. Um, sadly, my mother passed away a few months ago as a complication of her cancer. But I suspect that uh, having had the COVID virus uh, hastened her her demise. So you know, it's oh, it's, it's so very near and, near and near and personal to me. This you know, it's an existential threat, mm. really. Um, but it's also, uh, I think, a catalyst for innovation and for change, and. Uh, hopefully uh, for us to to capture lessons learned and to do things better the next time but mm. as a uh, as a physician and as an innovator i'm i'm also seeing it as somewhat of a, a silver lining it's it's hastened our adoption of telemedicine and telehealth mm. and uh, for things like the the telesurgery application that i mentioned i, I think we will have the ability to to work in rural environments. We don't have physicians in even rural parts of my own country, uh, let alone in you know, third world countries. Uh, so, you know, to you know, kind of expedite uh, innovation to deliver telehealth and teleoperation of things. Um, and it's also been a catalyst for uh, another technology that I can't quite talk about yet, but I, um, because my mother was hospitalized, um, there were certain things that happened during her hospitalization that I realized could have been uh, done better that you know, might have even expedited her healing and, and discharge from the hospital. So I've actually developed a medical device with a couple of colleagues um, that I hope to 
get into the hands of uh, manufacturers in the next uh, uh, couple, three months. Hmm. Uh, as I like to say, if, if you're not trying to be part of the solution, you're probably part of the problem. And uh, so since yeah. this hit me very uh, deeply, um, I, I really thought long and hard about how could we help people stay off of ventilators. And, and mm-hmm. so I have a technology that I think will, will do that. And uh, so. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. And, and so sorry to hear about your mother, but. Thank you. Um, and uh, one, one of the things that strikes me about, about this crisis and, and, and many other crises is, uh, is, is the, the proliferation of, of bad information or, or, mm. or, or poor information. Have you any advice about where people can get good information and who to listen to? Because I think that's going to be key when we look at like the vaccines are coming out and, and how they're sort of rolled out um, in the future. I, you know, I, I don't have a, a, a crystal ball or a, um, a magical way to make that happen uh, yet, although I've, I've thought a lot about it as well. Mm. I think um, as we uh, sort of evaluate the uh, the rating of scientific publications, its influence, score, or impact, uh, uh, um, there may be a way for us to uh, rank the uh, the veracity and the, and the strength of the arguments being made and in the, even our news media in that fashion in the future. But it is so it, it it's it's frightening the way uh, conspiracy theorists and QAnon and other types of uh, uh, ill-advised or just completely uh, erroneous information becomes fact because it's it's on the internet. Someone said mm-hmm. it on the internet. There's a link to it, and so it must be real. And so people can you know follow down that rabbit hole, and then it then it just kind of there's a groundswell of you know the Earth is flat. Well, no, the Earth is not flat. If in fact, if you get on an airplane, you can look out the window and you can see the curvature of the Earth. You know, it's it's not that hard to debunk <laughs> that, but uh, it, it, it's a it's a big big challenge for us. So, to answer your question, uh, for domestic news in the United States, actually, I turn to the BBC. Believe it or not, BBC is actually one of my news sources because you know they don't have a uh, a stake in in domestic policy or or news. So, I I, I look to other sources of information. Uh, to kind of provide a tie break because there's so much punditry out there. We have mm. more opinion makers than we have uh, newsmakers on, on TV now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, been, yeah, it, it's, it's when you politicize or <laughs> any, any of these, these processes when it's, it's, you just have to look at the objective facts. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, but then you, as a, as a layman, um, it's difficult to, to, to get those sometimes. And if you, if you go looking for information, you'll, you're going to get it. It's like, um, that, uh, basketball Three, player. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That basketball player, I think it was Kari Irving who, who, um, he got, uh, into the flat earth theory yep. and went down that rabbit hole because he searched for more information. And then eventually he, he realized how stupid it was <laughs> and had to say yeah. publicly he was sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's funny when it's not about a, a deadly virus, but uh, there you go. Um, so uh, there's a couple of questions which come in, which is which is great. Um, so we've got a, a question from Nadia here. I'll change the view because it's quite a long question, so may obscure your face there. <laughs> in terms of comfort in space, what would be the one item you'd ask to be solved, improved, e.g., day to day situation like having freshly ground coffee in the morning? That could be quite uh, dangerous in zero gravity, couldn't it? <laughs> Ground coffee. <laughs> Actually, uh, 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 Nadia, that's a great, great question. And, and your leading uh, answer is exactly what I would say. So I'm a, a, a Javaholic. You know, having a, a good espresso or cappuccino in the morning is very, very important to my performance throughout the rest of the day. And so when I flew aboard the, the space shuttle and space station, we didn't have an espresso machine aboard the ISS, but there was actually uh, an Italian astronaut, Samantha Cristoforetti, who uh, arranged uh, with the Italian Space Agency to design and launch an espresso uh, machine to the ISS. So now there's actually great coffee aboard ISS. So that would be the one creature comfort that I would uh, I would want to take with me to Mars uh, for you know, performance enhancement for sure. Um, but the other thing that uh, I didn't have uh, 
when I was aboard the ISS that's, that's also there now is, is really good connectivity. Uh, so you may have seen the Twitter feeds of the astronauts that are aboard the International Space Station. They mm. can browse the web. They can actually pick up an IP phone and call their families, even have video conferences on a pretty regular basis. That wasn't available to me during my career uh, as an astronaut. I, I left the agency in 2009. Mm -hmm. But um, when we start to think about going to Mars, uh, things get difficult again. Uh, communication could be actually 21 minutes one way to get to Mars, uh, and then in terms of radio communication, and 21 minutes back. So if your family were to, you know, uh, give you a call in the morning, hey, good morning, it would take 21 minutes to, to hear it, and then 21 minutes for you to say good morning back to them. So that's kind of a stilted uh, conversation, of course, but we need to figure out uh, optical uh, uh, transmission of data between Mars and Earth to be able to have speed of light uh, communication. So that's the one of the big challenges that I think we face. Yeah. That, was that um, difficult for you when you were um, in, in the space station, but not being have, able to have that communication and contact? You would like to have more of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, now, of course, it's it's that problem has been solved in Earth orbit. And I probably for the the astronauts who return to the moon, it's it's a quarter of a million miles away. So we can communicate quite well out to that distance. But when you're talking, you know, many million miles out to uh, to Mars, um, mm -hmm. we've got to take the next quantum leap in terms of uh, communications. Yeah. Um, Danny would like to know, being an astronaut sounds a fascinating career. If you had to choose a different career, what would you be doing instead? Although you've got quite a lot of <laughs> careers that, that you're doing it instead as well. Well, you know, I, I, I'm doing actually uh, what I love, uh, you know, nearly as much right now. So being, a, you know, involved in technology and trying to solve, solve problems. So I, in fact, I think being an astronaut is, is sort of, you know, being a, a problem solver uh, while wearing a space helmet. So, you know, it's kind of that, uh, you know, working in a challenging environment and trying to uh, evolve new new capabilities. So most of my job as an astronaut was actually on the ground. You know, it, it, it you'd think, you know, astronauts, well, they fly in space all the time. Well, actually, um, I'd fly every two or three years for a couple of weeks at a time. So most of my time was on the ground helping other missions, other astronauts, other crews, uh, other flight control teams do science and engineering in space. So um, I'm doing much of what I used to do at NASA, although I'm, you know, I'm firmly planted on terra firma and I, I don't get to wear a spacesuit anymore. So um, you, you've obviously had to lead in, in pretty extreme uh, environments and adversity. And, and I think that lots of people have gone through their own um, extreme experience um, throughout this year. Do you have any good advice about leading during during crisis and, and, and change? Yeah, it's such a, a great topic. Um, um, I, I think uh, there, there's the preparation and then there's the execution phase of, of leadership. So uh, preparing for a, a space mission, for example, it's, it's uh, not only preparing for success, uh, or, yeah, preparing for success, but also planning for for failures along the way. So really understanding the environment where you're going to be, how things are supposed to work, but how they might fail, and then working with your team to have a plan B and a plan C and so on. And so that was kind of the, the mindset that we took up into space with us on our missions. Uh, I certainly took it to Mount Everest with me. And uh, and I've I've used that same sort of mindset as an entrepreneur you know, running my company, this is a very unsettled time for any company uh, to raise money, to do technology development, to, to do marketing and, and to launch a new product. Um, so you have to be nimble. You have to be adaptable. The plan that you had six months ago, it's out the window. You know, the world is totally different now. So what are you going to do about it? You know, static organizations, you know, inevitably fail. So, um, you know, being resilient and being nimble, getting the, the best uh, advice from your team and also reaching out to other experts who have, have been down your similar path to you, uh, you know, having, having mentors that are invested in you. Um, that's what made it, made it 
that's what's made it possible for uh, us to succeed mm. uh, through this pandemic. Yeah, mentorship in the bio you sent us was something you mentioned, um, and it sounds like that's been really important to you. Is there sort of particular mentors that you you've had along the way that that um, you you'd sort of like to highlight, or also how do you sort of pick a mentor? I've had so many wonderful mentors who have become you know close friends. Uh, just dating back to my uh, my days uh, in medical school and, and working at the NASA Ames Research Center, you know, taking me under their wings, investing in me, um, not because they they had to, not because there was an obligation, but because they were they wanted to to kind of pay it forward, and uh, and so to the best of my ability, I I, I try to do that as well, um, and you know, I try to support other people who want to become you know astronauts or or aerospace engineers. There's a, a great program called the Brooke Owens uh, uh, Fellowship for um, uh, female aerospace uh, 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 talent uh, that I'm involved with, and you know, I I, I feel it's a it's an obligation uh, to 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 pay it forward since you know I benefited so greatly from the the wonderful people that helped me. Hmm. So, so looking to the future, where where are you going to get your adrenaline fix from now? <laughs> it looks like you've you've had to sort of punctuate your your career and your life with with a good dose of adrenaline. Um, <laughs> what's the future of adventures for you? Well, I'm I'm well. I'll, I'll answer it a couple of ways. Uh, in terms of pure uh, adventure and excitement, I'm really excited about uh, urban air mobility. So the the Jetsons, if you will. So using hmm. Uh, essentially drone technology, but being able to have one of these things in your driveway or in your garage and to be able to, to fly point A to point B uh, across traffic jams uh, uh, to uh, essentially have air ambulances that not with the complexity of a helicopter, but something that can be very easily piloted uh, by mm -hmm. anyone with five minutes of training. So uh, I'm very excited about enabling that, uh, that kind of future. Uh, so that is something that I've 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 already taken part in and hope to have a, a much greater role in in the future. But uh, the other kind of adventure, it it may not be as uh, uh, adrenaline pumping on the surface of things, but being an entrepreneur is actually probably the toughest thing I've ever done. <laughs> uh, you know, I always thought, in a simplistic, naive way, that the hardest part about becoming a success in a tech company was having a, a, a wonderful idea of you know, inventing the technology. But in fact, that's the easiest thing. It's the execution. It's um, building the team, raising the funds, you know, the, the manufacturing, the marketing. Um, uh, there's so many different pitfalls along that, that pathway. And so there's a lot of adrenaline, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, nervous energy associated with that path. And so uh, it's a high risk, uh, high reward environment, just the same. Yeah, there's. Um, I think it was uh, Reed Hoffman who said that it's like building the aircraft while you while you're already in flight. That's right. And yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> hurtling towards the ground, and you've got to you've got to put the engines on. Got to be quick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have to say, Scott, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, and and, uh, and uh, could talk to you for the rest of the evening about so many things but um final couple of questions I'd, I'd love to know what you'd like your legacy to be and and th there seems to be so many things which, which which could be um could be a path for that interesting question i you know i don't um specifically dwell upon my legacy per se um but uh, i guess if if pressed i would say that uh you know i would like to think that uh you know in some fa former fashion i I left uh, the earth at least a somewhat better place because of having been here, you know, I, that I earned the oxygen that I breathed, you know, to, to not be a suck on uh, the, the, the planet, but to be a, you know, a, a, a positive. Um, and I, you know, I, I would hope that that's everybody's aspiration that we all, I think if everyone kind of, you know, focused on trying to, to leave uh, the world a slightly better place, you know, to be good stewards of, uh, of our planet, um, we would do well by our children. 
Yeah, definitely. And and finally, just uh, do you have a book recommendation, either something that's, that, that sort of touched your life or or got you through um, some some uh, quiet time in, in lockdown? Uh, well, you know, actually, a, a, a kind of a self-help book that uh, helped me many years ago was a book by a physician, uh, M. Scott Peck, called uh, The Road Less Traveled. It's actually quite a, a wonderful, you know, thoughtful book. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I would like to, you know, leave things on an upbeat, uh, you know, humorous uh, um, uh, theme. So uh, the, perhaps the funniest, uh, most uplifting book, and we all need humor right now, I think, is a book uh, written by Bill Bryson uh, called A Walk in the Woods. And I remember um, seeing this book in an airport uh, you know, bookstore uh, one day, and I, I picked it up and I I read the first couple of paragraphs and I was actually uh, not only laughing out loud, but tears were you know, shooting from my eyes. I, it was just one of the most uh, hilarious uh, bits of, of writing I'd ever come upon. And, and I, I couldn't put the book down. And I think people in the airport thought that I was you know, clinically deranged. <laughs> so uh, if you haven't read the um, uh, Bill Bryson's book, A Walk in the Woods, Highly recommend that as well as I'll put in a plug for my book, uh, The Sky Below, if any of the stories uh, today sounded interesting to you. But those would be the two I'd recommend. Fantastic. Well, they did. They definitely did. And uh, on behalf of uh, Ben and myself, thank you very much for being on the series. I know uh, everyone listening has really enjoyed it. And, of course, it's going to go out to 50 different countries and a whole lot of other people will hear your wisdom and your experience and also – just the way you showed up, which is which is a real role model to us. And uh, we're heading off now. Okay, thanks. Ben. Wonderful to be with you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks. Cole. Take care. Bye. Bye.